following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today we're going to talk about this famous word, kundalini, which uh, in these times most spiritual inclined people have heard. And we've discussed kundalini, um, or mentioned it, throughout our lectures and of course throughout the books of Samael and Vior. It's important for us as sincere, serious spiritual seekers to have a very strong understanding of what the kundalini is because it's this energy that facilitates every spiritual development. It's the kundalini itself that is at the base of all existence. It's that root or raw foundational energy which a spiritual seeker wants to cultivate or develop or awaken, depending on which tradition or which terms they, they use. The word kundalini comes from Sanskrit. It's a very ancient word. It actually has roots that go as far back as Atlantis and beyond. And it refers to a kind of cosmic force, an energy, which is not like any energy that we know physically. Kundalini is not mere electricity or magnetism or heat, but it is the source of them all. Kundalini is a kind of force or energy that is pure, divine, raw potentiality, which is then modified according to its condition. And this is the key thing that is often missing in many texts or schools of Hinduism or Buddhism who address Kundalini more directly. In the West, Kundalini is also uh, a basic foundational aspect of religion, but it's more veiled. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's symbolized as the fire of the Holy Spirit, or that column of fire that led the Israelites in their great exodus. So this fire, cosmic fire, or intelligent divine fire, is kundalini in Sanskrit. In reality, any spiritual practice that we perform, any kind, whether that is a recitation of mantras, meditation, prayer, devotional song, karma yoga or selfless service, seva, all of these spiritual practices, no matter what tradition it comes from, has as its intention the awakening of this cosmic force within us. 
there's no exception to this. The very purpose of religion or yoga is to awaken this energy inside of the individual, inside of the person, to activate that force, because that force, that energy, is what connects us to the divine. It's what produces what can be called enlightenment or liberation. That energy is not active in most people today. And that's because the conditions that activate it have not been satisfied. Like any energy or force in nature, this energy of Kundalini or the Holy Spirit abides by the laws of nature. It functions according to cause and effect. Everything in nature, even God, respects the law of cause and effect. Karma, this law of action and consequence, modifies everything. Every manifested thing is subject to cause and effect. And Kundalini is no exception. This cannot be stressed enough because unfortunately there are many schools and teachers and books that have a lot of fanciful ideas about Kundalini and about its awakening, but which are all based in lies, theories, and dreams. The awakening of Kundalini is possible, but only when the causes are produced that create that effect. We're going to discuss those causes a little bit today. This is similar to any law in nature. When the causes are satisfied, the effects result. This is why when we observe society and the world, we see the psychological and spiritual level of humanity where it is. Because of cause and effect. Humanity is where it is because of the causes that humanity has created. Our current environmental situation, social, economic, political, every aspect of our life is as it is because of our own actions. And there is no exception to that. There is nothing being imposed upon us from outside Everything we experience is a result of what we are inside. And the same is true of the awakening of Kundalini. This cannot occur by the intervention of any outside force. There are many traditions that teach that a guru can awaken your Kundalini for you, or if you pay a certain amount of money, or if you wear a certain robe, or buy certain devices, or machines, or oils, all kinds of fantastical things that you have to purchase or pay for or agree to. And then somehow this outside intervention will awaken the Kundalini. This is false. And there are groups that state that the Kundalini is dangerous, that it can be awakened by accident. This is false. It is impossible. Why? Because the Kundalini is the intelligence of God. God does not act by accident. <clears throat> Enlightenment or liberation does not come by accident. It comes from producing causes. And to produce those causes requires great effort. Therefore, we can dispense with a huge body of books and theories and libraries and schools and teachers who repeat and repeat and repeat all of this nonsense about Kundalini. What we should do is study the actual scriptures, the experiences of those who have truly worked with this energy and rely upon their guidance, not modern people who are just trying to make money or become famous. 
When we do that, when we examine the scriptures, when we study the great teachers, both past and present, we discover that this force of Kundalini, the force of the Holy Spirit, is extremely powerful, but also extremely demanding. It only arises, it only arrives, it only enlightens those who deserve it. And those who deserve that enter into a very different experience of life. Someone who has this energy active within them does not see life the way we do, the way normal people do, the way the common person does. One great guru or teacher who explains the nature of this mysterious power, Kundalini, very well is Swami Shivananda. Swami Shivananda was a Indian doctor who was friends with Samael and Vyor. Shivananda lived in India and founded the Divine Life Society. And his writings are brilliantly clear about the nature of Kundalini and the requirements of this divine energy. And he explains in one of his books the experience of having this force active. He describes it this way. Super sensual visions appear before the mental eye of the aspirant. New worlds with indescribable wonders and charms unfold themselves before the yogi. Planes after planes reveal their existence and grandeur to the practitioner, and the yogi gets divine knowledge, power, and bliss in increasing degrees when the kundalini passes through chakra after chakra, making them to bloom in all their glory, which before the touch of kundalini, which before the touch of kundalini, do not give out their powers, emanating their divine light and fragrance and reveal the divine secrets and phenomena which lie concealed from the eyes of worldly-minded people who would refuse to even believe of their existence. In other words, this force opens our eyes, our spiritual eyes. There are many who claim to have this sight and who describe many fantastic visions and can give prophecies and teachings, but who contradict the most venerable and beautiful scriptures of humankind. We need to rely on the scriptures and on the great masters, not on the fanciful visions of dreamers, people who are hypnotized by their own pride. We need to instead wake up ourselves. To not rely on the words of others, the dreams and promises of others, but to wake up. Humanity at this time is like someone sleeping in a bed who dreams of learning how to swim across the river of existence, to cross to the other shore, to heaven, to nirvana. We are that man who sleeps and dreams of spirituality. We have a lot of ideas about it, a lot of fanciful notions that we've adopted from others, things that we've concocted on our own, fantasies, daydreams, projections of our desires. We imagine heaven or nirvana or spiritual development to be something that suits our ego, that supports our sense of self, and that reinforces our psychological traumas. The reality is that we are asleep, and we do not see Eden, Nirvana, Heaven, the truth, but we need to. So we may study spirituality, we may even meditate, we may do practices, but as long as we remain asleep and dreaming of spirituality, we are dreaming. 
We live in a fantasy land. There is an enormous fantasy land about the Kundalini. The Western culture has, on the spiritual side of things, become very fascinated with Kundalini. And fascination is a form of fantasy, a form of hypnosis. It has nothing of truth. The reality of Kundalini is completely different. It has nothing to do with the fantasies that people have nowadays about it. So it's important for us to penetrate that. Instead of lying in our psychological bedroom, sleeping and dreaming about Kundalini, we need to get up. We need to walk out of our psychological house. We need to see the reality of where we are psychologically and spiritually, the truth of our existence, and we need to learn how to swim to get into that river of consciousness and learn to swim across it. Crossing that current is very challenging, but it is possible. We may be learning how to meditate, how to do pranayamas, how to practice Tantra, and these are all good. But most of all, we need to awaken our consciousness in order for any of those practices to have any influence or effect. There's a synthesis that has to occur in us, spiritually and psychologically. There's a great story that illustrates this about the yogi Milarepa, Milarepa was a great Tibetan who began his life as any common person with no particular qualities that were noteworthy. But even though he made a lot of mistakes and actually performed uh, black magic and wound up killing people for revenge, he realized his mistake and was fortunate enough to find a true teacher, Marpa, who taught him a technique called heat, inner heat yoga, dumo yoga, which is related with the six yogas of Naropa or Niguma. <clears throat> and this technique is extremely potent and powerful and is related with what we're teaching in this tradition of Gnosis. Towards the end of his life, Milarepa achieved complete development as a bodhisattva. And he was approached by a person who wanted to become his student. And so Milarepa asked the student, what are your qualifications? Why should I accept you as a student? And the student says, I have developed perfect samadhi. I can meditate and reach absolute perfect equanimity and samadhi. And Miller said, that's, Milarepa said, that's great, that's good. But that's nothing in comparison with the meditation of the inner heat. And this was not said from pride. It was stated as fact. This inner heat is this cosmic fire that we're discussing. It's described as a heat because it can be felt as a heat. But really, it's a psychic heat. It's a spiritual force, which really has no form. It is not a fire in physical terms. It's electrical, but it is not electricity. It is energy, but it is not matter. It is something elusive, but everywhere. So Milarepa taught this student this inner heat yoga, and the student was Gampopa, who became his greatest disciple and helped start the Kagyu tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, which still exists today. And one of their heart doctrines or heart practices are these six yogas of Naropa. And the first one is the inner heat. Dumo. What this uh, technique does 
whether we call it Dumo Yoga, Kundalini Yoga, Tantra Yoga, all of these are different ways of approaching the same thing. Each one is appropriate for a slightly different psychology and arose in a different age. But they all address the same force. So we've started talking about some words that I want you to keep clear in your mind. Kundalini, we mentioned. Dumo, which is usually in English spelled T-U-M-M-O, is another word that I've mentioned. In both cases, whether we're talking about a Tibetan tradition or a Hindu tradition or a Christian or Jewish tradition, all of these practices, techniques of every level, of every school, ultimately point towards the development, the activation of this force inside of us. The most common symbol of this sort, of this power, is a serpent. And that serpent is universal. It's in every religion. In the Christian tradition, Jesus says, be ye wise as serpents. Because this serpent of Kundalini is what gives wisdom, intelligence. In the Jewish tradition, in the book of Numbers, we read about Moses, who was called upon to save his people from the serpents that were biting them. And God told him to raise a serpent upon a pole. And that serpent could heal them. So here we see two different serpents. Both are polarizations of this power. One positive and one negative. And its root is the same energy, but polarized. This is an energy that exists in the body. It is not outside of us. In the same way that no outside person can come to you and digest your food or transform the air in your lungs into oxygen, no person outside of you can manipulate or awaken your kundalini. It is in you. It is in your body. You can get assistance, and we need assistance, but not from a physical person, from inside, from our own being, and from masters who work in the internal planes who can assist us. They cannot assist us unless we produce the causes. Many of these schools that talk about Kundalini describe it in terms of powers, that the person who awakens Kundalini gains great spiritual powers, and this is what they use to attract students. It is true that when this force, this cosmic energy, is activated within us, it awakens our lost senses our spiritual abilities that we once had but lost. But this is not the reason why we awaken that power. The true initiate is not seeking powers or to dominate others or to impress others or to be special. The true initiate seeks to escape suffering. The person who receives the real science of working at the Kundalini is someone who is tired of the ego, who is tired of pain, who is tired of death. The real initiate wants to go back to Eden. The real initiate has remorse for their pride and their lust and wants to change that. You see, this power of Kundalini is God. It is the power of God, and that power is only given to those who deserve it. In other words, the person who, the real initiate, the real spiritual practitioner who follows <clears throat> the upright law, wants to leave suffering, wants to return to Eden, wants to be born again. The spiritual birth is only possible through the force of Kundalini. Now, the curious thing is that nature 
does not want this. Nature outside of us and our physical body as it is only wants to perpetuate nature. Our instinct is simply to be born, to eat, to defecate, to reproduce, and die. Nature doesn't care about our brain, or about our art, or our science, or our theories, or our beliefs, or whether we believe in God or not. Nature only wants to perpetuate itself. And this is why in all the lower kingdoms, this is the function of every organism, to perpetuate the existence of those organisms, which each one plays a role in perpetuating the planet. That's all nature wants. Nature doesn't want, doesn't care, doesn't need us to believe in God or not. Nature wants our energy. You see, every organism in nature transforms energy and transmits energy. The physical body that we have is no different. All of us as physical organisms are like cells in a great body that covers the skin of this planet. The human beings that we call human beings are really like animals, like cells who ingest, transform, and release forces. And those forces perpetuate life on this planet. Unfortunately, because of our brain, because of our sex, we're mistransforming that energy and harming the planet. That's why the planet is revolting against us, punishing us, you could say. That's why we're suffering in new ways, new diseases, new problems. But in the end, objectively speaking, if we look at this planet without attachment, without any of our philosophies, we can see nature doesn't care about our religions. Nature just wants our energy. And this is why in ancient times, people performed sacrifices to the gods. Those gods represent the forces of nature, elemental gods. And people would sacrifice different elements in order to provide energy to nature so that nature would not need their energy. So then that energy could be used for spiritual things, for development. Unfortunately, we've uh, forgotten all that. I'm not saying that we should be performing sacrifices, animal or sacrifices of any kind, because that day has passed. The sacrifice we have to make now is psychological, spiritual and physical, but in ourselves. What we have to learn is how to harness the energies within us and redirect them by conscious will. But to do that, we have to understand those energies, what they are, where they are, and how they work. So we look at our body. Our physical body is the basis of our ability to reach our full development. We need a physical body in order to reach enlightenment. It's a necessity. It's a requirement. And this is because the physical body is the place where all of the forces of the other dimensions join together so that they can be transformed. The physical body is the, the ground from which we can reach our full development. And this word ground is important. In Hebrew, it's adamah. And it's from the ground that Adam is taken. Adam, in this sense, represents our full development as a being who exists in Eden, the Adam of Eden, which is a complete human being. Adam Christ, in other words. And this Adam is taken from the ground, from the body, the philosophical earth, our own physical body. So we need to take care of this physical body. And this is why... In the first level of any religion, if you become a serious practitioner of that religion, you are introduced to all kinds of rules. Things that you have to do to create the conditions 
that will support the development of these forces. And those rules usually include do not kill, do not steal, do not take in intoxicants, do not eat impure food, right? In other words, don't put impurities in your body and don't use your body in ways that create harmful forces. The body has to be made clean, pure, and stable. Otherwise, this force that needs to be awakened cannot awaken. And so these rules are the commandments, the vinaya, the vows, all the rules. Yama and niyama in Sanskrit terms. These are necessities. People always say, I don't want a religion with rules. Too many rules. But they fail to understand that those rules are there because they produce causes and effects. They're not there arbitrarily just because of some moral ideal. It has nothing to do with morals. It has to do with cause and effect. The power that we're seeking is within this body. So let's look at that body that we have in order to understand this. The physical body is very complex. It has many interconnected and interdependent systems, but all of them depend upon the nervous system. It's the central nervous system and the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems that facilitate the functioning of the physical body. But those nervous systems can only operate if the consciousness is connected to the body. In other words, the physical body is a shell. Within that shell is a bunch of wiring. And that wiring is what receives, transforms, and transmits the energy. And the root of that energy is connected to our consciousness. So the nervous system is the intermediary. It is the, the vehicle through which all those energies function. The nervous system is very complex. We talk about it as a nervous system, but it actually is three nervous systems in one. The main one is the central nervous system, which is consisted of our spinal column with its 33 vertebrae and the brain. And these are one thing. You cannot separate the brain from the spine. They are one thing. And this is why a, an injury to the spine is so devastating. The whole body depends upon it. This nervous system and all its functions are symbolized in the Bible as the tree of life. And that is because it is our own tree of life inside. Without that, we cannot live. If this becomes harmed or damaged or messed up, life is over. We need a new body. And our scientists don't even understand it. It's so complicated and so mysterious and has so many things that we don't even know what they do that scientists are mystified. Moreover, they have proven that we only use a fraction of its cap capabilities. Some say 3%, some say 5%. What about the other 90 plus percent of the brain and, not, and nervous system's capacities? We have no idea what it's for. And this is because our scientists ignore spirituality. The esoteric sciences know very well what all those neurons and energetic pathways are for. They are for the arrival of Kundalini the awakening of this power. This nervous system is what is at the base of everything that makes us a person, physically. All of our powers, physically, are rooted in the nervous system. Reproduction, digestion, circulation, breathing, everything depends upon it. And what we look at when we see how the nervous system functions, we see at the top the brain. And the brain connects to the spinal cord, which descends through the neck, down the back, 
and to the base of the spine in the pelvic region. And at the base of that is the cauda equina. The cauda equina is a bunch of nerves, subtle fibers that emerge from the end of the spine. And from that disperse an incredible array of nervous filaments. So between this array of filaments and the brain is the, the spine from which emerge all the other connections and channels. This is physically. But this same thing exists energetically in us. You see, the physical body is only half of what we see now, of what we have here physically. What we see physically is only half of it. We've lost the ability to perceive the energy that enlivens or that gives the ability for the physical body to even function. That energy we call the vital body. In Tibetan, it's called the subtle body. This is the body of chi, or prana, as it's sometimes called, the ethereal body. It is the body of energy, or forces, that give the physical body the ability to be alive. And in that body are subtle channels of energy called nadis, the same as nerves, but in Sanskrit. They are channels of forces and energy. And within that ethereal or vital body is an even more subtle body, which is the astral, which likewise has all these nadis and channels and pathways for energy. And we go successively till we discover we have seven bodies that interpenetrate one another without confusion. There are seven more and more subtle levels of nature. And all of them have these pathways for energy to flow and move. All of them are interconnected and interdependent. For us, we're here in the physical body. We haven't yet perceived these other bodies. We don't know about them. What we need to understand, though, is that the way we use our energy here determines our future, our life, our health, how we eat, how we think, how we feel, what we breathe, what we drink, the environment we live within. All of these are producing causes and effects which determine our relative state of health or illness also psychologically, not just physically. And this is why we have rules, guidelines in religion. Because if we seriously want to develop the full capacity of this system in us to manage energy, we need to do it in the right way. These forces that we plan to work with are very powerful and require incredible responsibility to use them well. In the midst of this physical spine is the canalis centralis. And physically, if you look at a spinal uh, vertebrae, if you take a vertebrae out, you'll see there's a hole in the center. And through that hole passes the spinal cord down the center of the spinal column. Within that spinal cord is an empty channel, physically, through which fluids move. But within that, in the vital body, in the astral body, in the mental body, etc., are subtle filaments, not physical, energetic, subtle. They have matter, but not physical matter. Vital matter, astral matter, mental matter, etc. It's through that channel that ultimately the Kundalini can activate, can work. But as we are now, it is dormant. That energy is not active. And this is because we were cast out of Eden. Humanity does not have these powers anymore. But the capacity is there to recover them. Likewise, in the physical body, oh, that central channel in the subtle way is called Shushumna in Sanskrit. It's the central canal, not physical, energetic. 
Likewise, in the physical body, on either side of the spinal column, we have the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, which are a collection of ganglia or cords that transmit energies that manage other aspects of our physiology. And these ganglia or cords entwine around the spine. And there's two, right? One for each of those nervous systems. They, um, these are, uh, supply nerves for the involuntary organs like the heart and the lungs, intestines and kidneys. And they work, they work for and against each other. The sympathetic system stimulates or accelerates forces, and the parasympathetic retards or inhibits. So they are a plus minus. They are forces that balance each other. And this is important, because what we see now is in the middle, the central nervous system, which is the equilibrator. It's the one that is in the balance. And on either side are the sympathetic and parasympathetic. One is plus, one is minus. So we see here three forces physically, right? Three forces, plus, minus, equals. This is the basis for electricity. This is the basis for how energy moves in the universe through three forces. So physically, this exists within us through our three nervous systems. But energetically, it also exists within us in the vital body, astral body, mental body, and on. Energetically, shishumna is a vacant channel. It is empty, which is where the kundalini should be, but it's empty. That's the power that equilibriates, but it's not active. Energetically, we have ida and pingala in Sanskrit, which are these plus and minus channels or masculine, feminine, if you like, or yin-yang, if you like, od-ob, in Kabbalistic terms, or Adam and Eve. These are energetic channels. And they're shown in the caduceus of Mercury and many symbols throughout the world. These two symbolic serpents that sit around or entwine around a central serpent. Those are symbols of forces, energies. These Ida and Pingala are not the physical nervous systems. They are reflections. They are similar. They are related. They are not the same thing. Likewise, Shishumna is not the central nervous system, but it's related. I mentioned the cauda equina, which is at the base of the spine. That's physically. And that's where those nerves, there's a, a mass of subtle filaments, small, very um, tiny filaments there, nerves. But in the astral counterpart, in the subtle counterpart, there is an energetic center called the kanda. So you can see that we have a subtle aspect to each physical aspect. And you can see that it gets quite complex. I'm just giving you the, the kindergarten of this. There's a lot more to it. So this is something you have to come back to and study repeatedly in order to fully grasp it. The kanda is an energetic center where energies are transformed and transmitted. In the same way that the brain at the top of the spine is a transformer and transmitter of energy, and the spine is a transformer and transmitter of energy, so is the cauda equina physically. And the kanda is astrally or vitally. It's in the internal bodies, the subtle bodies. It is the... Um, the junction or the intermediary between 
Shushumna and the Chakra Muladhara. Now, this is where things start to get more complicated. I'm trying to keep it simple for you, but there are certain things that you have to see in order to grasp this lecture. A chakra is a Sanskrit word for wheel or disc. And chakra means it refers to an energetic center, not physical. It's a place where energy is moving and transforming. There are many chakras in the body, in every body. Often people talk about chakras as being physical or being astral. The truth is, every existing organism is filled with chakras. These are just centers of energy, transformers of energy. They are physical in our physical body. We have transforming energies in the physical body. They have a physical counterpart. We call them glands and organs. In the vital body, they are the same, but in the vital body. They are energetic transformers. Same in the astral body. Every one of our internal bodies has chakras. And those chakras have their aspects in the other bodies. When we study the kundalini and the awakening of the consciousness, there are seven fundamental chakras that we study out of the hundreds or thousands of chakras that exist. Seven main ones. The most important one for us in the beginning is called muladhara in Sanskrit. This chakra is related with the sexual organs. Why is this so important? Because life emerges from sex. All life, including spiritual life. This is the organ that we use to perpetuate life, that we use to feed nature. Likewise, if we want to be born again, we use the same organ, but in a different way. And this is why Jesus said, it's one thing to be born of the body and another thing to be born of the spirit. Both are forms of birth. Both are sexual. But the use of the energy is different. The important thing here is that the force that we need to liberate, the, fa the power and the energy that will awaken the consciousness and give us the sight, the vision, the spiritual insight we need, is enclosed within Muladhara. Trapped. Asleep. This is where the Kundalini rests and awaits for us to come and awaken it. It is in Muladhara. That uh, sleeping force is represented symbolically as a serpent that's coiled three and a half times. Sleeping. Why? First of all, Kanda or sorry, kunda in Sanskrit means coiled. This is where we get the word kundalini from coiled. And it's the same way that a serpent sleeps, coiled up, waiting. It's sleeping in muladhara, awaiting someone to awaken it. Us. That energy, when it is awakened, relies upon the kanda. It's through the kanda that that force can enter into the spinal column, into shushumna. And when that force awakens, it arises vertebrae by vertebrae, little by little, activating and awakening the subtle canyons of that channel in whichever body it's activating in. And as it passes up the spine, it activates those chakras or energetic centers and their corresponding powers, their corresponding functions. We call it powers, but really they are just natural functions. In the same way that our breathing and our digestion and our, everything about us physically is natural, the chakras are natural. They should be active. They should be functioning. But they don't. 
because of the causes and conditions that we have produced. So this energy that sleeps here we call kundalini. It's symbolized as a serpent. This power, this force, is the root energy of all existence. The kundalini is the primordial energy in everything. It is the shakti in Sanskrit. It's the power or fire that gives life to every existing thing. In order to understand this force, we need to really approach this scientifically. To not just accept theories, but we need to contemplate how things function in nature and understand that spiritual things function in the same way, just in other levels. When we study energy physically, we see that there are a variety of modifications of energy. Energy functions according to laws. We know that energy and matter are inseparable and totally related, and that they are just different modifications of the same thing. Energy and matter are a great mystery, very beautiful. Energy, when those forces are manifest as energy, that energy is modified according to its conditioning. Energy can be static or dynamic. In other words, it can be latent or in potential form or in an active form. Right? Everybody knows this? So within our cells, for example, we have potential energy and active energy. Within our body, there is potential energy and there is dynamic energy. Different forms. Kundalini itself is both, depending on its condition. Every part of us has kundalini. It has prana. It has energy. It has this power, but static in potential, not active. Every atom in existence has this. Everything, without exception. Because it is the fire that creates life. See, when we talk about kundalini as fire, it's not physical fire. It's spiritual. It's an energy, but it's not physical. It's something else. In Hinduism, they call it shakti. Shakti really just means energy. But Shakti is usually um, represented as a mother, as a woman, a goddess. And the universe is her body. So we are all particles of that. So if the Divine Mother is pure energy, we can understand that. All of us are here and exist within that body of energy, the universe. So that is there within us, but not fully developed. It's longing for development. And in our bodies, that is condensed, synthesized, and as a seed in Muladhara, in this chakra, in us. The physical exponent of that seed is in our sexual organs. And that's why Muladhara is there. We utilize that power, the creative power of Shakti, physically to create children. That's the power of God to create. That power comes from kundalini in the ultimate sense. Right? This is not awakened or developed kundalini, but it is due to its power. So when we talk about kundalini, really, we're talking about the Divine Mother. We're talking about the goddess. You can call her Isis or Mary, Tara, Athena, Minerva, whatever name you want. But she is the cause of existence. Her body 
is energy. And her pure potentiality awaits us in our bodies. Kundalini is the cosmic power that according to conditions and how the universe is unfolded and how physical bodies are created, that energy enters into activity in degrees. Now, when we study energy physically, we see that energies always manifest as polarities, as a range. Light, for example, there's a huge range of light that exists in the universe. Our physical eyes only perceive an extremely narrow band of that light. But with certain tools, we've discovered that there's an incredible array or extension of this polarity of light. And this is measured by wavelengths, very rapid wavelengths and very slow wavelengths. But it is a polarity that extends, you could say, up and down. The same is true of magnetism. Things are positive or negative. The same is true of acidity or, or something being alkaline or acid. Right? The same is true of gravity. Every energy manifests in this way, and Kundalini is no exception. And this is one of the great misconceptions in a lot of spiritual groups. A lot of spiritual and even scientific groups who, who believe mistakenly that energy can only go up. And all these groups that teach kundalini yoga and fantasize and dream about awakening while they still enjoy their lust and they still enjoy their pride and they still protect their fear and their envy. Not realizing that that power of kundalini not only can go up, it can go down. It can create and it can destroy. And this is why in Hinduism, Shakti has a spouse. Shiva. Masculine and feminine. Two forces. Shiva can create or destroy. At the same time, Shakti can also be Kalima. She's probably the most commonly uh, invoked goddess in relation with Kundalini Yoga. Kalima. But Kali Ma is a duality also. Kali Ma, Kali, can be a positive goddess who liberates, and she's also the goddess of death, the goddess of hell. This is very clearly represented in Hinduism and in Buddhism, and yet so many spiritual seekers ignore it with this fantasy land idea that because they have good intentions, they naturally must be awakening positively, ignoring the facts, not being scientific, being asleep in their fantasies. So this power, this energy is a polarity and it can be utilized in different ways according to its conditioning. This is the important point. Moreover, like any energy, it has degrees of manifestation. We know, for example, that something can be more or less magnetic, right? Something can be more or less acidic. Gravity, so far we think it, it doesn't change much, but actually we're starting to realize that gravity even has levels. Gravity is not a fixed thing like we used to think. All energy is subject to modification. On other planets, gravity is different because of the conditions. So Kundalini is no different. When people talk about awakening Kundalini, there's an idea that you flip a switch and Kundalini is fully developed. And really, this is a sad joke. Nothing in, in, nothing in nature works that way. Nothing. What happens is that that energy 
does appear and disappear in the same way that you light a match. When you light a match, the flame emerges seemingly from nowhere, we think. But in reality, that flame comes out of the matchstick, liberated from the atoms in the matchstick. But that flame will only burn so long as there is energy there. And when that energy is exhausted, the flame is exhausted. It goes out. It goes away. Kundalini is the same. It's the same. People who meditate or who learn pranayamas or even learn tantra can experience these types of awakenings, flashes. You may have had in meditation a brief ecstatic experience, then it goes away. That experience is due to energy. We can say it's kundalini. It's an energy that is briefly there and produces illumination and light, but it goes out because there's no more fuel. Make sense? This is why when we meditate, sometimes we can't get anything. No experiences. It may be because there's no energy. It may be because there's no fuel to light the fire. This is why in this tradition, we teach you how to harness these fires, how to use them. And this is the basis of Dumo Yoga. It uses a, what's called a vase breathing technique. It's a form of pranayama, which I cannot teach you. You have to be initiated in that tradition. But it's related to the pranayamas and, and other exercises we teach in Gnosis. Through that practice, the student harnesses forces in the body, and those forces produce the illumination. And that's why Milarepa told Gambopa, your meditation may be beautiful, but it's nothing compared to inner heat. Because that inner heat yoga produces, provides energy, which produces illuminations that a typical samadhi cannot compare to. This is why the work with energy is so important. Again, it's not to have powers or seek ecstatic experiences. It's to know the truth, to comprehend why we suffer. And we can only do that by seeing it, not through theories, not through beliefs. So this energy is latent there, waiting for us to activate it. We have certain rules that we have to uh, apply in order for the conditions to be set. The basic rule is to work towards sanctity. Sanctity means purity, cleanliness. This is not physical, although it's related. We shouldn't be a filthy pig physically. Our body should be cared for and clean. Really, this is referring to psychologically. Why is that? Because the Divine Mother will only emerge according to the conditions. People who practice Tantra, while enveloped in their lust and their animal desire, invoke the Divine Mother through lust. Thus, she emerges as Kali Ma, the mother death. And she will awaken them as a black magician. The pure initiate, the white tantric, clears the mind of lust, of fear, of envy, of pride, and invokes the Divine Mother, who can emerge then in sanctity as a virgin. Because you know, Kali is virginal. Athena is a virgin. Vesta is a virgin. The goddess, the pure goddess, the real goddess, cannot have anything to do with lust. Period. No exceptions. Yet, to invoke her requires sexual energy. That is her power. Sex. So we have to apply certain conditions, certain rules. This is why we learn to meditate, to self-observe ourselves, to watch our mind, to correct our behavior, to avoid impurities psychologically. 
to reject from our life, from our mind, from our heart, fornication, adultery, lewdness, pride, envy. All of these qualities, impurities, that prevent God from emerging, from appearing. In other words, we need to clean the temple, our mind, our heart. Then God can emerge. You see, this power of Kundalini is the power of God. One time, at one time rather, in the past, humanity knew this directly. Humanity walked with God, talked with God, could see the heavens. And this is symbolized in the Bible as the time of the man and woman in the Garden of Eden. Before the fall, before the temptation to abuse that fruit. But when humanity was seduced by desire, humanity was cast out. We've discussed this at length in many lectures and books. But in synthesis, we, we always look to ourselves and we see that Adam represents, in this context, our brain. And Eve, in this context, represents our sexual organs. And the serpent is the one who delivers knowledge through sex. The serpent is, of course, Lucifer, the bearer of light, in Latin, who is the servant of the Divine Mother the representative of the Divine Mother, her attendant, who does her will. People think Lucifer is a devil. He is in us, because we made him that way. When he's free of ego, he's our best friend. Eve is tempted through desire, by her own desire, the serpent, you see, if you read the story, the serpent doesn't say, eat it. The serpent just asks questions. But Eve sees that the fruit and feels desire. She feels this desire to eat it, and she does. That fruit, of course, is the orgasm. It is animal sexuality. We know and ex have explained this at length, why this is the case. In the courses or the lectures about Da'at, about Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, many lectures. The result is, of course, that having eaten, Adam and Eve discover that they are naked, and God comes to them and says, what have you done? And the woman says, the serpent enticed me, and I ate. This is the sexual organs who did this. And God says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed be you more than all the cattle and more than all the beasts of the field. You shall walk on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I shall place enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will bite his heel. When Adam and Eve were in Eden, before the eating of the fruit, Adam and Eve could perceive God directly and spoke with God, which is in the story. God asks a question, Adam and Eve can answer. This represents humanity. It also represents us, our own brain, our own sex, our own earth. We could see God and talk to God. But then we abused the fruit. So God says to the serpent, curse you more than the cattle and the beasts. Why? Because the cattle, the beasts of the field, the animals fornicate. Yet they fornicate only by instinct, by following the laws of nature, according to their own level of development. But we fornicated because of desire. And thus God says, you are worse than animals. 
worse, which is true. Look at humanity. We are worse than animals. We are enslaved by desire. Enslaved, powerless because of desire. And we destroy not only each other, but the planet. No animal does that. Animals respect the law. We do not. We don't even respect ourselves. We destroy ourselves because of desire. Every pain, every suffering, every problem that you have in your life is because of your own desires. And so, the serpent fell. Where we once had that energy active in us, that serpent fell gradually over time. This was not an overnight thing. This occurred over generations, long ago. But the result was that that energy fell and became inactive in terms of the positive upright force. Instead, that energy inverted itself. The opposite polarity emerged. And this is represented in other stories of Cain and Abel and all the problems that came after that. This is why the, um, God says, you shall walk on your belly. When we walk, it's how we conduct ourselves, how we move through life, how we go from one thing to the next. The serpent depends upon the belly, gluttony, desire, consumption. The serpent is cursed as a beast with animal desire who depends upon his desire and, is, and subsists himself upon desire. That's why we have so many desires. That's why we always want to feed our desires. It is that energy that wants to be fed. That serpent in us. This is why we are so addicted to the orgasm. You see, what's interesting here is, as I mentioned, this energy is a polarity. It's a great cosmic force. Originally, when mankind made this mistake... This was the first time that the orgasm was discovered. Previous to this, the orgasm did not exist amongst humankind. It was forbidden. And that is the meaning of not eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Because in the animal kingdom, when the souls or the consciousness was evolving up through the lower kingdoms, reached into the animal kingdom, the orgasm is part of the development of that level of nature. But upon entering the humanoid kingdom, the orgasm must be abandoned in order to ascend to a new level. So the early humanoids did not commit that mistake. That's why they gave that commandment, thou shalt not fornicate. And thou shalt not eat of that fruit. Unfortunately, due to this temptation, which is a, in detail is a very long story, humanity discovered this energy of the orgasm. What is that? When we enter the sexual act, we connect two very complex organisms. But we connect them where the most powerful energies are in the body, the sexual organs. And those organs are the root forces of creation, the powers of God. Now, normally, when we're not in a sexual act, all the powers that come into us, the power to be alive, descends through these three nervous systems, the three forces, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Those come through our three nervous systems. But the ultimate expression of that energy is sexual. The ultimate expression of the creativity of God in us comes through sex on the mechanical level. The ultimate level is spiritual, obviously. But merely physically, the highest degree is sexual creation, physically. So when we unite two physical bodies sexually, man and woman, 
that fire is lit. This is when the causes are there for the fire to emerge. That fire is sex. That's the creative power of God. And this is why we see Shiva Shakti, God and Goddess. The Elohim, which means God and Goddess. Abba and Ima, Father, Mother. Yabyum. These symbols represent the creative power of God, which is reflected in us sexually. Thus, when that connection occurs, all of these forces gather and begin to charge the sexual organs and the chakra related to the sexual organs, muladhara. And that energy is intense. Moreover, it is the energy of Eden. Bliss. That's why we feel pleasure. All those nerves... All those ganglia of the three nervous systems collect there. The one who's managing that energy, the one who's pushing that energy, is the energy of Eve, who sees that fruit and wants to taste it. What is that? Ida, the feminine serpent. And the responsibility or duty of that energy is procreation. That's the root driver for sex. That's why nature pushes us to have sex, to procreate. Nature tempts us, the kundalini, the energy of the Divine Mother, through Lucifer, tempts us through Eve, Ida, our urge for procreation. We join sexually, and all those energies to create begin to emerge. In the past, that energy was taken advantage of and utilized spiritually and returned through the kanda, up the spinal column, through shushumna, in order to enliven Adam, the brain. So Eve and Adam in us work together, just as Adam and Eve physically work together, in order for those forces to return back to God, for that woman to be the fire offering that we discussed in the lectures on Ta'at. Unfortunately, when that energy becomes very charged in the sexual organs and in the vital and astral bodies, humanity a long time ago was tempted to go further, to see how far they could take it, to have children on their own without the guidance of the Elohim. What happens then is that these energy transformers, the chakras and the sexual organs, short circuit. You see, a conductor only has a limited capacity. Any conductor of energy is like a, a channel or a tube through which energy can move. When you put too much energy there, you short circuit it. You create a loop or a, you create a, a misdirection of the energy and that circuit overloads and that energy escapes into other areas. This is the, what the orgasm is. It's an overcharge of energy. And that overcharge spills out of the sexual organs, out of the chakras and into the surrounding ganglia, into the nadis. That's what we feel as an orgasm. And we think it's pleasurable because the root energy is. What we don't see is that that energy destroys. It destroys the organism gradually. This is why people who have a lot of sex gradually lose their sexual power. People who really become addicted to the orgasm and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, gradually lose the ability to have it. They become impotent or they become indifferent because these centers become burned out. Now, this is why we see everybody wants to take chemicals to stimulate their sex drive. And there are a lot of chemicals that you can get. And this is why pornography became so popular because it, it is an artificial stimulation for the sexual energy. 
The problem is people are so addicted they don't realize that that energy is destroying them. It's put in the wrong places. That energy, which is extremely high voltage, is being put in places that cannot direct it and manage it. People go mad. The brain gets messed up. The nervous system gets messed up. This is why people who are addicted to masturbation and sex develop all kinds of mental and emotional problems. Many of them end up in sanitariums. We don't talk about this on the news. As you look into it, you'll discover. Anyone who's worked in a mental hospital will tell you most of the people there are addicted to masturbation, the majority. Why? Because of desire run amok. Because that, as that energy destroys and destroys and destroys, it takes more and more energy to feel anything. People become desensitized, so they seek greater and greater forms of stimulation. In other words, more and more extreme sexual practices. Little by little. Lifetime to lifetime. Gradually. Subsequently, the mind degenerates. The heart degenerates. The person becomes more and more of an animal. You can look around in the world and you'll see the evidence of this. Thus, the serpent is condemned to walk on the belly. Worse, God says, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. What is this dust? This dust is the dust that Adam comes from. Remember, Adam is taken from the dust and will return to the dust. We've talked about the dust in other lectures as well. This dust not only relates to the Adama, the ground, the body, it is also the archetypes of the soul. You see, the serpent is condemned. It cannot perceive the, the superior worlds, but it consumes the potential to realize them. This is a subtle Kabbalistic phrase that basically says, the sexual energy, when polarized negatively, traps the consciousness in hell. The archetypes that we should be using to create the soul are trapped inside the ego. And thus the serpent eats dust. And it says, And I shall place enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And this is that eternal painful conflict that we have in sex because of desire. That enmity, that conflict that we always have sexually. We're in and out of relationships, in and out of love or lust or whatever we think it is. Satisfied for one moment and dissatisfied the next. Never finding what we're seeking. So, all of this became heightened in, 19, in the 1960s. All of us can see that. When the age of Aquarius dawned and new cosmic forces were propelled against this planet, the Aquarian forces, which are very revolutionary, we saw our entire society turn upside down. And why? The two great things that emerged, spiritual longing, rejection of the old ways spiritually, and sexual longing. This is because the two are totally related. You cannot separate them. You cannot separate sex from religion. When that Aquarian force hit humanity, all of a sudden humanity says, where is the real religion? And where is real sexual satisfaction? These two questions emerge at the same time. That's because of the force of Aquarius, which is pushing humanity to begin a new era. Unfortunately, because the serpent in us is polarized in the wrong way, 
we began to experiment with sex and with religion and with drugs and with desire. And we had this so-called sexual liberation, which in fact has produced more suffering and problems than any kind of liberation. There's been more pain created from that than anything else. The same is true of this misguided spirituality that has emerged since this time, where people think since the 60s that you can do whatever you want and make up your own religion and reach God. And this is a lie. The ancient religions are ancient because they have truths that cannot be avoided. Cannot be avoided. In synthesis, having understood some of the parameters of this energy, we need to understand that it is possible to return to Eden. There is a method. There is a way. All hope is not lost. That method is entirely inside of us. It does not depend on anything outside. It is psychological. It is spiritual. And to do it requires that we return to respecting the law. Do not fornicate. Do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. We have to learn to utilize those forces with respect. And that way invoke the Divine Mother to be present and guide us. Whether we're a single person or married, this is our work. The single person can utilize all the spiritual practices prayer, meditation, pranayama, runes, many, many techniques. But if they don't do the psychological part, they will either gain nothing or just more suffering. We have to prepare an environment for the Divine Mother to inhabit. And that environment is inside of us psychologically. This is why in the Bible, Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Both the serpent and the dove are symbols of the Holy Spirit. To be as wise as a serpent is to have this wisdom or knowledge of the polarity of Kundalini and to know how to use it. To be as harmless as a dove is to respect the law, to follow the guidance of God, not our own selfish will. Jesus also said we have to raise the serpent on a staff as Moses did. We do that by following the law. Moses raised the serpent, the fiery serpent, it says in the Bible, on a staff. This is how we work through Moses' willpower to raise the serpent up Shushumna to the brain. And as it ascends, it recovers all those lost senses so that we can see God again. And this process occurs in degrees, many degrees, 33 degrees in each body. And only Adam and Eve in cooperation can do this. In other words, a married couple. It's only a married couple that by combining the two bodies can create and originate enough energy to awaken the sleeping serpent. A person working by themselves cannot do this. It's impossible. Because a person by themselves cannot rectify the mistake that we made in Eden. That mistake can only be rectified by a man and woman who cooperate with each other. Furthermore, Either a couple or a man and a woman working together can experience this energy. And there are many types of experiences that can emerge. When we talk about awakening of Kundalini in the Gnostic tradition, we're talking about spiritual birth. In some other traditions, Hinduism and Buddhism particularly, they talk about awakening kundalini, and they say even a single person can. In fact, even Shivananda says this. But he's not discussing the second birth. 
He's not talking about being born again, which is what we're talking about in Gnosis. When Shivananda or Naropa or Marpa or any of these teachers who talked about using Dumo or Kundalini and awakening that, they're talking about lighting a candle or lighting a match. When you meditate, when you practice, and you bring those conditions together so that flame can emerge, that is an awakening, but it's temporary. It will be there if there's fuel and conditions. And that's how you can have experiences in meditation. You can have comprehension, intuition, insight, experiences out of your body. All of these things are produced by that. But don't confuse the lighting of a match with the creation of a sun. The light that comes from a match is small and temporary. A sun, on the other hand, is a whole other level. And that's what the second birth is. The second birth is the emergence back into Eden. That awakening is completely different from sparks or flashes of Kundalini, Kundalini's energy activating a chakra. Be clear on that distinction. There are a lot of people in the world who talk about having experiences of awakened Kundalini, but understand it in context. They may have these experiences, but it doesn't mean they're positive. They may be negative. They may also be fantasizing. They may also be lying. It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what you do, what you experience, what you create. As a single person, you can create sparks. When you learn to use the vase breathing technique of Dumo or Pranayama, you learn to meditate, you learn, and you, by prerequisite, save your sexual energy, which is the rule in all these traditions. And there's no getting around that. If you have the energy there, and you know the techniques to focus and utilize and direct that energy, you can have experiences. Beautiful experiences. And we need them. Otherwise, we won't believe in any of this. And I promise you, if you apply the science, you will have them. This science is real. And that's why Milarepa said, this practice of Dumo is better than any Samadhi. Any other typical tr tradition or technique like Zen or Chan or typical sort of meditation practices. When you learn how to harness this fire, you will have experiences. But you have to know how to understand them and how to create them by will. And that only happens if you know how to work with energy. So there's a lot more we could say about Kundalini. It's a very deep and complex subject, but hopefully that gives you an introduction. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah, there, there are some dietary guidelines. And each tradition has little varieties. Um, the basic idea in Gnosis is that, uh, firstly, you shouldn't eat pork. And the reason is because that flesh comes from an animal that uh, has certain vibrations in it that can negatively influence your psyche. So it's better to avoid it. You also shouldn't take alcohol, drugs, smoke cigarettes, a lot of this kind of stuff, which puts a lot of stimulants into the nervous system. And those stimulations prevent you from seeing the more subtle perceptions or the subtle forces that are active there. And they interfere with it. Alcohol and cigarettes and drugs and all those things really interfere with the, the normal function of the nervous system. So those need to be abandoned. Um, otherwise, one should just eat a, a very healthy diet, the best kind of food you can get. Don't eat junk food. Don't eat garbage. If you're putting things into your temple, you want to put the best things you can. It's not to eat expensive, but to eat well, to eat pure food, not chemicals. Yeah. So we try to we try to represent, you know, recommend you eat the purest food you can get, you know, and this includes like don't eat canned food, don't eat grafted or, or hybrid kind of foods, which are sort of the, the what do they call them, Franken fruit. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't eat that stuff because there's there's stuff there are things happening in that food that we don't perceive physically. Those foods do not contain the vitality that we need. 
the forces, like Frankenstein, but Frankenfruit. It's a joke. <laughs> um, you should drink plenty of water, keep the body hydrated, and before you meditate or before you go to sleep, don't eat heavy meals. Eat light at night. Uh, also, you should have, uh, you have to learn for yourself what's the right amount of meat to eat. But in tantric tradition, you eat meat. And this is because in meat there are forces that, the, that, the, that you need in order to work with this fire. So we talk about that in other lectures too. Question? The question appears to be about uh, implying that there is a difference in how everyone awakens. The only difference between the path that any person will take is determined by their own karma and their own idiosyncrasy, psychologically and spiritually. The path is the same. As an example, to light a candle, you need the air and the fuel and the combustible element, right, to, to start the spark. This is true no matter where in the world you want to light a fire, no matter what language you speak, right? But those elements can be a little different. You can use a rock and a flint, you know, you can use two sticks, you can use a match, you can use a lighter. So there's different techniques, and the same is true spiritually. And that's why we can look at, for example, Hindu Tantra and Buddhist Tantra, and there are differences. Differences in practice, difference in, differences in how they describe the occult physiology. But ultimately, if you apply the technique, you arrive at the goal. You see, each of these different groups has a slightly different idiosyncrasy, a slightly different need, and also different karma. So the path is one path. This is what Jesus said in the Gospel. There is one door. But the door might look a little different for us just because of our own idiosyncrasy. You have a question? One up here. Okay. Um, you mentioned something about Lucifer. Um, and that, you know, once we get rid of the ego, Lucifer is our best friend. And I remember in early lectures, the Gnostic instructor said that Satan was the mind. Now, That's right. We always had the impression that Lucifer and Satan was one and the same. Lucifer, you know, when he fell, became Satan. Could you clarify that for me? Sure. There is a difference between Lucifer and Satan. The word Satan is a sort of a degeneration of the word Shatan in Hebrew, which means adversary. And he's an adversary in the sense that he's our trainer, or the one who tempts us. Lucifer itself is the bearer of light. This is the, the cosmic force that carries the fire. And that fire is Kundalini. But when that fire becomes trapped in the ego, that fire is polarized negatively and becomes Satan, the adversary or the opposite right, of God. So that's all. As long as that fire is trapped in desire, in ego, it is Satan. It's the devil. It's not outside of us. It is our mind. But when that force is liberated... It is the bearer of light. It is the greatest angel in the hierarchy of our own consciousness. So it is our best friend. Right? So it's a matter of degree. Another question back there? How can nature be suffering because of us if it only wants our energy? Nature is suffering because of us because we are destroying nature. In the past, humanity lived in harmony with nature. Humanity respected the law. And this is symbolized in the Garden of Eden. When humanity walked and talked with God and there was peace everywhere. There was no war. There was no hunger. There was no death. In the sense that we know it. Nature you know, always survives based on the energies that are created and, and synthesized by the organisms that exist within it. We are one of those organisms. Unfortunately, 
our organism has become cancerous. And we're destroying our host, which is nature. And that's why nature is rebelling against us, starting to punish us for that, or try to purge itself of the infection. That's all nature's trying to do. Nature's trying to save itself from us. Another question? We have many subtle bodies because nature has unfolded in levels. In the same way that the ocean has great depths, so does our consciousness, our soul. Nature is not just physical matter. It's far more than that. And our internal bodies correspond to those other levels of nature. We experience those levels of nature when we dream. When we are not in our physical body, but we're traveling in other places and maybe even other times, dreaming different things. And those are experiences of other dimensions. And we experience that through other bodies that we have. Ultimately, our goal is to awaken and perfect those bodies so that we can travel throughout those regions consciously at will and be a conscious citizen of the universe be a conscious participant in the great hierarchies that exist in the entire universe. This planet is a speck of dust in a vast, beautiful infinite. And there, are, there are intelligences and civilizations that we cannot even imagine that are all around us. And they're there waiting for us to become part of it. We can. First, we have to return to Eden and respect the law. And having done that, having achieved the second birth, then we have a choice. We have a choice of which path to take, how to develop further beyond just being restored to Eden as a normal human being. You see, right now we're not normal. We're very abnormal. That's why we're isolated from the rest of the universe. We get visited physically and internally by other intelligences, other races, But they have isolated us because we are too dangerous. We are a cancer. We are a disease on the body of the universe. And until that disease is cured, we have to be isolated for our own good and for the good of the rest of the body. That body is the body of Christ. It's all the races that exist in this infinite. So if we restore our place, we purge ourselves of the psychological and spiritual disease that we have, which is the ego we can return once again to our rightful place, which is at the entryway to develop ourselves throughout those regions. To do that, you cannot be limited to your physical body because those regions are not just physical. Some of them are physical, and others exist in other levels. And We need the capacity and ability first to see them and two, to interact with them at will. A great saint or great master or avatar has accomplished that. And that's why they come back to us and tell us stories about all these kingdoms and paradises and worlds that they've seen and visited. And if you listen or hear these stories, you would be amazed. But as Shivananda said, most people here don't even believe that's true. They believe it's all fantasy. It's the opposite. That's what's real. Our fantasies are a lie. The reality is out there waiting, and it's inside of us waiting. Um, along that same theme, um, this could stem from a, a misunderstanding of some of the or He seemed to describe that in the previous rounds of creation and in the subsequent rounds to this one, that the physical reality did not exist, and that it um, only perhaps like down to the astral world exists or down to the mental world or something like that. And you, you described in this 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 um, beautiful lecture how we need the physical the physical body in order to achieve this uh, this, this type of development. So. How can that be accomplished in today? Good question. Both are true. I was sort of synthesizing it to make it a little simpler. Um, the physical world crystallized and emerged during the Lemurian Age. And this was the time that humanity was tempted and fell. The Lemurian Age is the Garden of Eden. It was that time. Previous to the Lemurian Age were the, the Hyperborean, Polar Ages, etc., which is when humanity was pure, but not physical. 
during Lemurian era, Lemurian era, humanity began to emerge into the physical world. In other words, all of creation was descending and crystallizing more and more into matter. During that process, what has to happen is that the physical body is created and emerges. And this is when the Kunda buffer was introduced, this organ. It was during that moment that the temptation occurred, when the physical body was starting to crystallize, when humanity was starting to enter the physical world. And this is what it means when it says, and their eyes were opened. They started to develop physical sight, more than just the internal sight. And this is the cosmic evolution in any corner of the universe. Gradually, matter settles from more rarefied forms into more concrete forms. The physical is the, the end. And from the physical, it's supposed to return back upwards. So I just wasn't getting into all of the, the stuff. We need the physical body in terms of cosmic evolution, and we need it in terms of our personal evolution. Right. So that body only emerges at that stage of the development of any humanity. Previous to that, there are other levels of work that are happening. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,